Good morning. I'm Laura DiOlesi, the Executive Director of the Milken Institute's Asia Center. Welcome to the fourth episode of the webinar series, The World Post COVID-19. Every Friday at 8.30 a.m. Singapore time, the Asia Center of the Milken Institute is hosting short and to the point conversations to address the transformations that will shape the world post COVID-19. Last week's episode focused on the global credit crunch, and next week's episode will focus on entrepreneurs and how CEOs of unicorns are finding opportunities amidst the chaos. With these webinars, we're aiming to bring the Milken Institute event experience virtually to you. Today's episode will focus on the impact of COVID-19 on real estate investment. The discussion will be moderated by Peggy Sito, the Deputy Business Editor of the South China Morning Post. With us today, we have four real estate experts, uh, Stuart Crow, the CEO of Capital Markets Asia Pacific for JLL, Hugh Andrew, uh, Asia Pacific Head of Asset Management and Real Estate at BlackRock, Kenny Go, the President and Managing Partner of Go Capital, and Abhinav Reddy, Executive Director of the GAR Corporation. Before I pass it on to our moderator, I would like to share with you a couple of things that the Milken Institute is currently doing to address the COVID-19 crisis. Our Faster Cure Center is tracking 100 plus vaccines and treatments from around the world with updates um, on their latest development. And our Asia Center has created a dashboard of COVID-19 crisis that tracks how and when governments in seven different Asian markets acted in terms of public health, stimulus package, financial aid, philanthropic efforts correlated to the number of positive cases. The dashboard, the tracker, along with all of our other efforts are publicly available on our website. Now, without further ado, I would like to pass it on to our moderator. Thank you again, Peggy, for moderating our fourth episode. I'll leave you to it. Thank you, Laura. Uh, can you hear me well? Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining this webinar. Um, we are in unprecedented historical times. The COVID-19 pandemic has been hitting the world's economy, almost every industry, including real estate. One Hong Kong developer told me that um, his company's security and cleaning services division had more income than the entire hotel operation in Hong Kong because occupancy of his five-star hotels were down to 2% or even lower. So we can tell how bad the situation is. In the next 45 minutes, we would like to explore the real estate's outlook in short and longer term, the steps that investors are taking to address virus exposures, and where are the bright spots. We are very happy to have four panelists here today. They are the, as Laura mentioned, they are the leading players in the real estate industry. So they will share their views and the insight with us. At the beginning, I would like to invite every panelist to spend one or two minutes, briefly tell us how their business or investment were hit by the coronavirus. Um, may I ask Stuart to start first? Um, Stuart is the CEO, Asia Pacific CEO of JLL's Capital Markets. Stuart, please. Thanks, Peggy. Uh, yeah, we've been spending a lot of time in the last uh, month or two speaking to some of the world's largest uh, investors on, on both their investment plans and also their existing investment in Asia Pacific. I think it's clearly a scenario that um, that probably none of us were, were extremely well prepared for, and particularly the speed of some of the lockdowns and, and as you say, real estate closures in, in hospitality and retail. Um, so the investors have been you know, very much focused on asset management, um, you know, uh, data collection and asset management and technology is helping around real estate. It's a lot better than what it was probably 10 or, 10 or 12 years ago. So I think data collection around performance of rent collection, et cetera, has been pretty good. Uh, and investors have been saying to us that they're largely playing sort of defense on their, their portfolios, uh, speaking to tenants, governments, uh, their investors and, and banks. So that's really been the focus for people. We haven't seen a lot of distressed selling in the, in the unlisted markets, perhaps unlike the public markets, uh, as we feel that it takes a, a little uh, little bit of time for this to, to wash through. So the investment markets uh, have taken in part a, a bit of a pause while, while um, large investors really focus on the asset management of their portfolios. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, may I invite Hild of BlackRock to share all your will? Yeah, thanks, Peggy. <clears throat> um, I think Stuart nailed it quite well. The focus for our our teams is now very much on the asset management. The investment team and acquisition teams are obviously uh, much quieter 
than they were in 2019. Um, we have assets in the PRC, Singapore, Japan, and Australia, and each of those markets are at different stages of um, their impact cycle, if you will, according to the severity of COVID-19 and the restrictions or the, the measures that, that the respective governments have taken. But certainly mm -hmm. to echo Stuart's comments, we are very much focused on the asset management piece. A huge amount of communication. You cannot communicate enough at the moment with all of your stakeholders, your customers, mm -hmm. your tenants, uh, your service providers, and of course, our investors who are constantly needing to look at their forecast adjustments uh, to understand how they can navigate the next six months. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, Kenny, is it the same happening to you? Kenny? Um, Can you hear me? Yeah. Ah, okay. I think my somehow my mic was turned off by uh, by somebody. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think um, uh, like everybody else. I mean, obviously we um, we look at our, our bank financing to make sure that uh, we do we do enough stress tests on our cash flows uh, to make sure that we meet debt service and uh, debt covenants. Uh, but ultimately, we have two balance sheets. Right. We have one balance sheet which is uh, existing assets mm -hmm. to take care of. Uh, and then another balance sheet would be uh, an invested dry powder. Uh, and in, in this environment, obviously, we also look at uh, what are the new opportunities. Uh, okay. But for the existing uh, assets um, balance sheet side, I would say the different asset class would perform differently. Uh, we, have, we have hotels, which of, of course is performing very poorly. Uh, we have office buildings, which are less affected. Uh, we have uh, uh, retail malls, which some are affected and some are less affected. And then we have um, asset class like logistics, warehouse, and data centers, which are performing very well. So it just mm -hmm. depends on which, you know, which sector you're in. Yeah, that's true. So how about, uh, I mean, uh, you have a big portfolio of office parks in India. So are your business affected? Hi, hi, Peggy. Yeah, so there's two aspects to it. One is as a landlord, uh, there is not so much effect yet because all the office buildings are operational and live, although vastly empty. But uh, the tenant servers are still running in from there and there's no problem in accessing the office building. So there's not much effect as a mm -hmm. landlord. The other aspect is as a developer. So all the construction and construction sites have come to a complete standstill in India because of the curfew. So that mm -hmm. is where I see the biggest, biggest impact because uh, we estimate for every day of lockdown and uh, stalling of activity, it takes us about three days to recover back to normal. This is because of various factors like disruption in the supply chain and uh, migrant labor force that we are dependent on. So there is more mm -hmm. of an effect on the construction, which will in turn impact the upcoming supply and uh, not so much on the existing operational office assets as yet. I say as yet because the yeah. situation is changing uh, every week, and the longer we have this lockdown and curfew, uh, the worse it's going to get. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, it's not easy to predict when this crisis will be over. But, um, we would like to know now the investor sentiment amid the COVID-19 outbreak. Stuart, um, you were involved in a lot of fundraising in the direct real estate investment in the past few years. So how is the capital market right now? Are investors very pessimistic about the outlook? Do, they, do you see them facing any liquidity issue right now? Yeah, I think things have changed a, a lot, Peggy. I mean, uh, without wanting to sort of talk too much about, about history, because things have Absolutely changed, but you know the markets have been very strong. So you know we, we, this virus has come at a, at a point when transaction volumes and uh, and prices for real estate in Asia Pacific have been been very very strong, and, and that's been driven by the fact that yeah there's been pretty good GDP growth uh, across a lot of the, the other markets, and just the trends of growing wealth and, and urbanisation. And, and on the flip side, with investors, um, you know which uh, both Hugh and, and and Kenny particularly are you know, very, 
very focused on. There's just been a huge amount of in, investor interest in, in Asia Pacific. So whether it be sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, insurance, have all been increasing their, their allocations to Asia Pacific uh, for diversification and also to, to um, direct real estate. So things have been very, very strong. And you know, we've had um, record transaction volumes year on year uh, for, for now the last eight or nine years. But it's fair to say that 2020 will be a, will be a very different story. Uh, and already in Q1 of this year, year on year, we've seen transaction volumes decline uh, in Asia Pacific by about 30%. Um, they sort of helped mm-hmm. globally, but uh, Asia was the, the first impacted. And that's really, as we all talked about before, investors have, have put a pause on, on activity. Um, but I think, you know, I wouldn't describe the, the market as, as pessimistic. I think there is some uncertainty, um, definitely, uh, and investors are, are sitting on the sidelines. But those, um, you know, those large secular trends of people putting money into real estate uh, will, will continue uh, from domestic and, and global, global sources. I think people are, as I say, they're on the sidelines. Travel restrictions is, is changing um, just right at the moment how people can get, get deals done. Uh, and there is definitely uncertainty about the impact on on cash flows, uh, and there's the, the longer term uh, uncertainty about economic growth and and maybe changes to how some real estate is used. But um, as I say, investors are, are telling us that um, yeah they've got money, they're waiting for for better buying. Um, mm-hmm. and the expectation is that there will be um, you know there'll be strong trading activity. So pessimism is probably not the not the right um, word. I think there's definitely uncertainty. Um, but there will be, you know, I think things will return, um, maybe not at the same prices, but trading activity will return. Um, you know, I think probably certainly towards the, the latter part of the year, we'll see uh, activity starting to resume strongly because there is very strong liquidity in the system. Okay, that is uh, positive news. So the coronavirus, there's a con- consensus that the COVID-19 will cause a sharp shock to the global e- economy, as you mentioned, in the first quarter of this year. So what is next after the crisis? So we expect to see a sharp rebound in the economy and in the real estate market. I think investors always think, remember what happened in SARS in 2003. What do you think? Yeah, people keep talking about different proxies for for the outcome of the pathway here. You know, I'm not so sure that, that certainly I'm convinced that uh, that SARS is a, is a good in itself was a, a sort of a, a black swan event that occurred a long time ago. And uh, and real estate usage and investment, at least um, very different and perhaps much more, this one's much more widespread. So, um, but I think, you know, as I said, I do think we'll see a, large, a sharp rebound, if that is what uh, a V-shape is to, to trading activity. Um, as markets open up, sentiment improves, and uh, unfortunately, pockets of distress occur. Uh, value recovery, however, um, might take a little bit a little bit longer, uh, at least uh, mm-hmm. discovery, and uh, and that's really because it's a function of cash flow. Uh, and there's in some sectors and countries that are going to be be more uh, impacted. So for for investors, there's a real focus on on what demand is going to look like from occupiers. Now, how much rent is being collected at the moment, uh, and the general health of, of corporations. And I think we can already see that some asset classes have been much more defensive um, through this crisis than others. And things like multifamily, logistics, uh, data centres, uh, we're seeing investors tell us that their rent collection is just much higher in those sectors. So we we're already starting to see some secular trends where where people were focused on those asset classes as being defensive, and I think that will only accelerate. Um, and and also things you know like medical office and health related real estate will be will be a beneficiary. Uh, and mm-hmm. so unfortunately, we talked about hospitality and, and retail. There, there will be some some uncertainty. Um, so yeah, I do think that there will be a sharp recovery. I think that the pace of um, of value discovery and pricing recovery. In, in markets will change and, and the impact on real estate values, I think what this one, this crisis shows is it's different from market to market. And there's some markets that have very strong domestic liquidity and I, you know, I think places like uh, Japan and Korea and to, to a lesser extent maybe China, they're not really relying on uh, on foreign capital at all. And I think those, uh, although no country will be immune, uh, those countries probably stand up, uh, stand up better. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think trading activity will, will return pr- pretty quickly. 
Okay, thank you. So may I also address these questions to Hild of BlackRock? Uh, so we expect a rebound in the economy and uh, where is the asset? Yeah, I think the rebound is inevitable. Um, you know, he with the biggest and best crystal ball wins first prize. I think that it's going to be a 12 to 18 month recovery period, I think, realistically. This is, you know, this is the biggest social and economic disruption in post-World War II modern history. And nobody has has got the, the records or the experience uh, of something of this scale. So it's very difficult to, to gauge the exact timing. But I think that the real estate economies across our region, you know, from the subcontinent where Adenad is, right through to uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, you know, with the exception of some of the Southeast Asian countries, they're all quite mature and robust markets. Uh, you know, lots of institutional interest. It's not just about opportunity. So the lending environment uh, has to react accordingly. Um, as Kenny said, you know, one of, the, one of the things we've really been focusing on is our ability to pay our debt. And, of course, you know, you do that as a matter of course when you buy an asset. You, you want to make sure that your revenue stream is going to cover your, your debt cost and your ownership cost. Um, and you have to stress test that, and this is certainly stress testing it. So for this, for 2020, we were, we have a lot of powder. We've just raised, you know, nearly $600 million uh, in first and second close for our Asia Fund 5, uh, and we were ready to go. Uh, we, well, we closed a deal in Adelaide. We closed a deal in Sydney. Um, we were looking at some opportunities elsewhere. Um, so we're a little bit disappointed that we don't have that that ability to, to invest. However, we do see opportunity um, and, you know, we're working on that pipeline, that future pipeline. Um, but we recognize that it's not going to be necessarily a completely distressed market. Sure, there will be some distressed assets, but I think the market's so robust and mature enough uh, that things will recover and the majority of our peer group will, will come through it. Mm, thank you. So, um, as Stuart mentioned, we saw that different real estate asset classes have been impacted by the virus to different degrees. So, after the crisis, what is the investment focus in short term and longer term? So, which asset class will see better growth potential in your view? Uh, Hilt, um, can you Sorry, I was, adjust I was to... On yeah. you. Look, I think that I okay. think I think that there will be opportunities across the board. Um, as Kenny mentioned, you know the hotel hospitality sector has taken a massive hit, um, but this is Asia, and people want to come on holiday to Asia. So when that 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 silo, that whole travel silo, is is back to normal, you know you'll see some pent up demand for that, which will generate the revenue. Um, but I think. We'll continue to look at all sectors. You know, do I wish that we'd own some logistics, uh, particularly in China? <laughs> yes, I do, but we don't. Um, but we'll continue to look at all asset classes. I think what will change will be the, the analysis on the sensitivity of each of these asset classes. How robust are they in times of stress? Retail, for example. What kind of retailers do you have? How are the leases structured? Are you, are you charging rent? with a GTO, or is it a lot more sharing than that? So I think the, the outcome of this, this, uh, this disruption to the market will make us all look long and hard at how we operate and uh, create value from our assets. I think that will be the biggest change. Um, but I think, again, it's a robust environment. Look at retail. You know, shopping is a national pastime in a lot of Asian countries. I think... It's a lot more robust here than it is in Europe or the Americas. Um, and, uh, and I think that, that in a year's time, we'll probably be back trading, uh, looking at opportunities across the board, but we'll just be looking at them with a bit more of a microscope. Mm, thank you. So one more follow-up question. How about that uh, co-working and co-living 
sector. So I think in the last two years, it was a very hot topic. So will the sector be dying out after the COVID-19? Uh, I'll give a very quick view, but it, it, it's a question I'd like to ask, that, you know, I'd like to get the view from the rest of the panel. I don't think it will die out. I think it will accelerate <laughs> the process of, of the weaker firms falling away and the stronger firms taking up their market share. Um, uh, you know, WeWork is obviously the, the big name, and they've got their own uh, issues with regard to debt. Um, but clearly, I understand that Hong Kong, you know, has seen a, an increase in the use of co-working space, but Singapore has seen a decrease. So there doesn't seem to be a consistent pattern. But I'd be interested for the other members of the panel to give a view based on their experiences. Yeah, thank you. So, Kenny, um, what do you think? Do you agree with the uh, Hill's will? Do you have any, any any investment in in co-working or co-living space in your in course portfolio? Yeah, we do. We we have some PE style investments in uh, in those kind of uh, spaces. Um, I I would say that uh, both co-working and co-living, uh, I don't think they'll die out. Um, I think the problem that they have had is the valuation that the markets have given them. Uh, and because they've been given such high valuation, they were pushed to a business plan, which is only sustainable if they can continuously uh, raise fresh funding nonstop. Uh, and now that that funding has dried up, a lot of them are in trouble. But I would say uh, as, a, uh, as a business, as a service for users, um, I think these are attractive uh, uh, propositions. Uh, the shared desk, uh, the flexible workspace, um, the shared uh, community for uh, co-living. So I, I think they, they would continue to be in, um, they'll continue to survive and, and even thrive in a, in a different form, but probably more uh, like a um, hotel management uh, contract type of format where uh, landlords will own the, own the real estate uh, and good management companies, good operating companies would manage for them for a fee rather than these companies taking on taking on leases, uh, fitting out themselves and operating, taking care of it. So you will see a consolidation in the there'll sector. Consolidation. There'll be consolidation, and there will be <clears throat> a rationalization of the valuation, uh, and therefore they would uh, they would run the businesses in a different in a different way uh, from the balance sheet point of view. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So your company has a big portfolio of assets um, from hotels, office spaces to logistics parks and co-working. So could you please tell us the steps that the company is taking to address the virus exposures and uh, what is the future strategy after this COVID-19? Yeah, so I think like, like most people in the beginning, we are more reactive uh, because nobody can predict this uh, coming. Uh, as as late as um, March 12th, I was actually in uh, Madrid and London. So you can, you can imagine, uh, I mean, it, it's like a different world. I mean, I, I was in Madrid because we have, a, we have a string of hotels there. And uh, we had a board meeting with our local uh, Spanish partners, and we were looking at how good the numbers were. And we were all excited about expanding the business, uh, renovating, upgrading. And then a week later, everything was closed. Uh, so you can imagine uh, it's a bit uh, more reactive. Um, and different asset classes, uh, would we, we, we are doing different things. Uh, as I said earlier, hotels are hit the worst. Uh, we have pretty much closed out all the hotels in, uh, in North America and Europe. Uh, Asia has been gradually closing down. Uh, Thailand closed down early April. Uh, Hong Kong just closed down this Monday. Uh, Japan uh, closed down recently also. We have a, we have a resort in Okinawa. Uh, and then the only thing, uh, and Vietnam also, uh, in Da Nang, uh, the only thing we have open is in Singapore and Australia. Australia, there's still domestic business. Uh, and Singapore, there is basically quarantine uh, type business. Um, but, no, but no real commercial business anymore. So that sector has been hit very hard. Um, other sectors are less affected. Um, offices, um, because you have, uh, you have uh, longer term leases, um, so really not really seeing too much movement yet. 
Uh, on the retail side, uh, most of our retail in Hong Kong are community malls. Um, and the different, sec different trades are doing uh, differently. So supermarkets and uh, food markets, convenience stores actually have been seeing their, their, their trading numbers up, especially the supermarkets. We've been seeing 20 to 40% growth uh, the last uh, two months. Uh, but then on the F&B side, uh, the, the restaurant business have been having a hard time, especially large format uh, Chinese restaurants. So we've been focused on helping tenants, especially SME type tenants in the food, uh, in the F&B trade and in the education trade. Uh, those, those sectors have been hit hard. So we've been focusing on SMA uh, type tenants and small chain type of uh, operators to help them through. Um, in China, um, as I said earlier, data center has been doing very well. Logistics warehouse, especially in large tailwind cities, um, the, the occupancy rate has been up. Uh, and even some of the tier two cities since the lockdown uh, ended in China in the last two weeks, in, even the tier two cities we've been seeing uh, leasing activities picked up for, uh, for logistics. Mm -hmm. and then uh, one, uh, one good, um, I guess, um, uh, point, I mean, the, the point of reference to, to see from, uh, from retail is also in our retail outlet malls. These are branded outlet malls selling discount goods. So all these malls, we have, we have uh, five of these in China, uh, large scale outlet malls. All of them were ordered to close during the, uh, during the lockdown in China. Uh, and the past few weeks they have all been, uh, other than Wuhan, they have, everything else has, has reopened. And some of them actually have traded a lot better than we expected. Uh, for example, in Chengdu, a city which is uh, less affected by the, uh, by the virus, uh, our trading number so far actually has been 20% above uh, what we projected pre-crisis. So uh, you can actually see a bit of uh, what you so-called revenge uh, spending uh, from, from consumers in these kind of sectors. Mm -hmm. it is, it's, a, it's a good sign uh, that I think China uh, consumerism is starting to come back. Yeah, so it is a really a challenging time for as a manager right now. Um, Geographically, as you mentioned, seems China recovers faster than other countries outside. So um, in future, which countries will you see better prospect, um, China or any Asian countries you think that will have better performance? So I, I think, I mean, we, we usually look at medium to, at least medium term out. Uh, and I would say before the crisis, if you ask me this question, I, I have been telling people that the, the countries I like are uh, Vietnam for its uh, strong growth and also being a beneficiary from the trade war. Uh, and then uh, we like Japan uh, for its very strong levered cash on cash uh, yield. Uh, and then uh, I like Singapore because it's in the right place in the cycle. Uh, it's basically the only large, only major market where prices went down in the last uh, five, six years. So it's, a, it's in a recovery mode, and so we're in a good place in the cycle. Now, if you look at it today, uh, what has really changed, right? Uh, I think Vietnam is still having strong growth, uh, and is still been a, uh, a beneficiary from the trade war, uh, and probably a beneficiary from this uh, virus also, because they have managed their, uh, the virus situation pretty well. Um, I don't see the, I mean, cash flow in Japan, uh, we've been focusing on uh, office and multifamily homes, uh, the cash flow from those kind of assets are still strong, so I don't see anything really changing there. Uh, Singapore obviously having a tough time now with the uh, second wave of infections, but uh, that government, I, I have pretty strong confidence that they are going to manage it and come out of this well. Uh, so I think um, 12 months down the road, these will still be the three places that uh, I like. Uh, China actually, Surprisingly, to many people, is coming out of this uh, ahead of uh, probably ahead of um, everyone else. Uh, and there, we uh, we like anything which has to do with uh, domestic consumption uh, and technology. So we have been investing in uh, outlet malls, which is in the domestic consumption era uh, area, uh, and technology uh, benefits e-commerce, uh, so benefits uh, logistics warehouse and data center. So these are the areas that we like. Uh, and we continue to like that. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, very interesting. I think that um, now your company has a large portfolio office parked in India, um, where they have. You mentioned uh, the construction as a developer is affected. So, what is your company's investment strategy? Are you still focusing um, on India, or you will consider other countries? So, in terms of investment uh, strategy, right now the plan is to conserve capital and wait and watch because things are in such a fluid state. Any decision we make now could be invalidated in a month. One of our biggest fears is we see a W-shaped curve with the virus recurring sometime in November, December, which would uh, cause a lot of problem in case we restarted activity to original 2019 or early 2020 levels. So since our business is so capital intensive, most of the long-term uh, money invested is in for three or five years in terms of cycle of investment. So we really need to be sure about uh, the environment before going ahead with this sort of investment. In terms of expanding to other countries, no. I think uh, real estate development is really a domain-specific industry where you're strong in your home market. So we're going to be sticking to some core office markets in India for the time being. Uh, but as of now, like I said, it's wait and watch. We're not going to invest in any new assets. We had some plans to invest in hospitality, mm -hmm. which is postponed now, but probably stick to office assets in the next uh, three to five years because they are the ones that are the least affected amongst all the asset classes and probably the one to be first to recover once the lockdown ends and we get a vaccine for the for the virus. So that's the plan as of now. But if you ask me in a month, it could change. In six months, it'll change because we've never faced this sort of situation before where where the business is at a standstill and you can't step out of your house to address it. So it, it's it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. um, people talking about uh, talking about the knowledge economy, mentioning about those companies related to 5G data center um, that will see more uh, better prospects. Um, your company also have a lot of big clients like Amazon. Will they be affected, or what do you think? So, so within our portfolio, we're seeing we're seeing different reactions from different types of tenants. So, a lot of the larger uh, services companies that are dependent on third-party contracts are in a wait and watch mode. So, they are not expanding yet. Their immediate plans to hire more people are put on pause. But there are some companies that are very bullish. So like you mentioned, Amazon is a large portfolio uh, tenant of ours, and they are lo actively looking for another million square feet of space as we speak, which is a very good sign. So there will be some companies that are benefited in, in even in the short term because of the situation. But most of them are uh, adopting a policy of postponing all the decisions that they were supposed to take this quarter to probably two quarters from now. Of, of course, the larger ones, Capgemini, Cognizant, Technology Services, HSBC, they, they're here to stay. So this sort of short-term blip doesn't really affect them. Uh, some of the smaller companies, we're seeing pushback from them in terms of rentals, deferment of space, and things like that. But uh, I think overall, the, the negative sentiment is outweighing the positive sentiment in the short term. In the medium to long term, I believe the story is fairly solid because of... Uh, being in India, the young population, our recovery is going to be much faster. And in general, what we've seen in the last uh, two down cycles, which was in 2001 and 2008 and 9, is that whenever there's a lot of cost pressure on corporates in uh, the European Union region and the USA, they tend to uh, try to cut costs by offshoring more jobs. So within a year or so, I think we should see more demand coming in for uh, long-term office space in the Asia-Pacific region, both in India and places like Vietnam, Philippines. So that, that's a good sign. We just have to wait it out, is, is my opinion. Thank you. Um, back to the questions, uh, which countries will see better prospect, China or any other Asian countries? Would other panelists like to share your views? Um, sure, here, Peggy, maybe I'll have a, a quick go. Um, yeah, I think in the last uh, few years, you know, we'd often talk to investors in Asia Pacific and particularly new ones about you know, the opportunities being uh, both cyclical and, and structural. And um, uh, in some of the markets in India and China, you know, there's clearly long-term long -term, uh, structural reasons to be 
to be investing in those markets and urbanisation and demographics and some of the things that Avana um, referred to as well. So I think don't think those things change. And um, although growth slows down a bit, I think India and China still benefit from that. And uh, as Kenny mentioned, um, the cyclical opportunities have been sort of few and few and far between because most of the markets have been in a in a strong upswing. Um, I think probably investors become a bit more opportunistic because the the cyclical opportunities, either by sector or by country, um, through distress or, or other reasons, uh, become much more prevalent. So I think people will be more opportunistic. I think we'll see a, a, a larger wave of corporates out on leasebacks, and I think that's something that we've seen a lot of activity in just in the last six or eight weeks. So people will be will be looking for those. Um, but then you know, I think, as I say, China and India, and then you know, I, like Kenny, I continue to like the role of. Singapore in the ASEAN region. I think um, it's got a very pro-business um, uh, environment, and I think it's uh, it's upskilling of of the various sectors towards technology and biotechnology, biomed, etc. Will be will be important. And uh, investors are telling us that in in these times, yeah, currency is also important. And I think uh, people are attracted to the the defensive nature of the Japanese currency. Um, on the flip side, they're possibly attracted to the to the low Aussie dollar. But I think yeah, Japan is a place where we will continue to see flows of, of capital um, into. But people, I think, will be much more opportunistic uh, in the sense that it won't just be about one one country. It'll be about, um, as I say, those cyclical opportunities that pop up. Thank you. So, Hill, um, do you have a view to share? Yes, Peggy. Um, yeah, we like Singapore, uh, Japan, Australia, uh, China, and uh, I think we're watching brief on Hong Kong. Um, you know, obviously, the, the the double black swan perception with you know the, the uh, political disruptions last year. We had a conversation offline before we started about that. Um, you know, we, we manage an opportunity. Um, so we're, you know, we're looking at the cycle, as Stuart pointed out, it's very important. But we're also looking at opportunity and value creation outside of those natural cycles. And you know, this event will cause some distress. Um, and you know, we'll be looking at those opportunities, either you know, as single owners, or you know, if, if, if people are looking for. Uh, equity support uh, as a joint venture partner, uh, and also where we can leverage our, our experience and knowledge around the region in in value creation for assets, the, the buy, fix, sell approach that we, we often take. So th those locations were target before COVID, and they remain very much uh, in the frame. Uh, we've got a continuous watching brief around the region. And aside from our real estate business, BlackRock, has a, a very large uh, credit business in its equity platform. I'm sure Abinev is aware of that because you know a lot of, there's been a lot of focus on the subcontinent, India particularly, um, mm -hmm. and real estate is not excluded from that. So, um, you know, there are going to be opportunities across the board, um, but I think we're all kind of agreeing that the market was moving in a certain direction. It was very very tight. Um, and once we've got over the impacts of, of COVID, the market will probably continue with some opportunities to to look at distress. Um, asset classes, you know, I think Kenny summed it up very well, but we'll certainly focus on our commercial uh, objectives, uh, office, retail, mixed use, uh, industrial, uh, logistics. Um, we, you know, we, we own some residential in Japan, and, and we don't see that as, a, as an issue. Um, but yeah, our focus will continue to be on the office and retail. Mm -hmm. I, I saw different central government have announced that unlimited QE. Will it give a help to the real estate sector? Uh, yeah, I think, I think any any fiscal initiative to to reinvigorate economies is going to help. The real estate economy. Um, it may reduce the uh, distress opportunities, but you know, uh, as we've all discussed, you know, revenue is a very important part of of our investment 
business. And so if, if government and fiscal initiatives support business and their customers in our buildings, then they can pay the rent. So, of course, uh, you know, we, we would look at that as, as a policy. Okay, thank you. Um, one question is, when will we see, we, we expect a consolidation, we expect to see more M&A activities, but when will we see all these steel volumes to pick up? Um, can I address the question back to Kenny? When will we see the steel volume pick up again? Um, yeah. It depends on how long the, uh, the shutdown is. So I, I uh, to me, I, my, my guess is uh, every day of shutdown will take two to three days to recover. So two to three times of, uh, of the length of shutdown will be, will be the recovery time. And the longer the shutdown is, the more uh, veer towards the, higher, the, the longer end of it. Uh, so I would say if, if the shutdown is ended in three months, then your recovery would be six month, will be six months to nine months. Uh, if it is six months, it would be 12 months to 18 months. Um, mm -hmm. So it really depends on when everybody reopens. I think the, um, some of the markets with uh, large domestic economies uh, would recover first. So China would be one, um, Japan would be one. Uh, US seems to be in the thick of it right now, but I think when it ends, it will also be in that category because these places have uh, very large domestic economies, uh, which can, uh, you can achieve um, levels of normalcies, which uh, countries which rely on uh, external trade and tourism uh, cannot. So okay, I you. think different markets will just, you know, recover differently. Sure. And so thank you. Is. Yeah. Uh, time is running out. I have to wrap up. So thank you all panelists. Um, in conclusion, we are very happy to see that our panelists are still optimistic uh, about our look in, in the very long term, even though we, we cannot predict when the crisis will be over. Uh, as activity returns, so investment focusing on domestic consumption or e-commerce um, may, may see more exciting opportunities. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, for all of you joining this morning, um, we just, hope to just before, we'll just before have... we wrap up, sorry, I just wanted to add the best term I've heard this morning yeah. was from was from Kenny uh, when he said revenge spending. I really like that. I'm definitely going to do some revenge spending and revenge traveling. After this. <laughs> 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 yeah, we hope to have another webinar soon, and at that time, all bad news will be gone. Thank you for <laughs> listening. So I will back send back give you back, Laura. Thank, thank you, Peggy, you. Stuart, Kenny, Hugh, and Abhinav. Thank you for the insightful discussion, and thank you for ending on a happy note. Uh, before, we, before we go, I would like to plug Mike Milken's new podcast that can be found on Spotify and Apple. In each episode, Mike addresses the current crisis and how it would change the way we work, socialize, and fight disease for years to come. You should really check it out. Thank you, everyone. Wishing a good day. Okay. Thanks, thank thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.